Hey there everyone, welcome back to the Dang Cave and welcome to another video build. So, in today's video build, I'm going to build the venerable, ancient, obsolete, 135th scale Tamiya SAS Jeep. Now, shock and awe, 35th scale, what's going on? Uh, so yes, so I have turned to a 35th scale kit for something a little bit different. So, I suppose over the last couple of years, actually rewind that a little bit. Let's go back a bit further. So, four or five years ago, I pretty much built 72nd scale. That was it. Aircraft. The odd 144th scale. And ever so often maybe a car or a bike. Because I always loved them. But years ago I never built them well. And then over over the course of a few years I think. You know. Getting an airbrush. You know. Having a much better environment to work in. I kind of expanded my kind of modelling range a little bit. Based on at least what I thought was an improvement in what I built. So along that journey at some point I did kind of ponder. You know. What, what have I never built and, and interestingly I mean I've, I've you know over the years I've built aircraft in all scales ultimately mainly concentrate on 72nd but I've built other scales uh, built cars and bikes today it's never really done any kind of large scale cars well there's the, the maybe one over there uh, and the one thing I've never done is 35th scale I've done some 72nd, 76th scale armour stuff before. Uh, a few times over the years. They're more a kind of quick little distraction build. Normally an opportunity to play with some weathering techniques that I wouldn't normally play with. But on a very kind of small scale. Uh, and yeah, 35th scale I've never really done. Not once. So, but it was always a few subjects that interest me within the 35th scale so being irish there's a few kind of irish military vehicles which are which are modeled in 35th scale so things like the the panhard the old rolls royce armored car from you know the the 100 years ago early days of the the irish free state uh things like the the scout that airfix have just released i think the irish army operated them as well uh so yeah so stuff like that is always kind of thought if I'm going to build armour it might build something like that so not as drawn to tracked vehicles as kind of other subjects and having sat and watched SAS Rogue Heroes at the back end of last year uh, while well, I was at Telford I decided oh time you do an SAS Jeep I'm going to get that which is what I did picked it up for a tenner absolute bargain so today's video I'm going to build it. Now, it's not going to be multi-part series because, it, you know, I think multi-part videos are a little bit instructional in a way. So they're, so they're there to help other people maybe learn. They're there for me to kind of watch my progress and, and kind of log what I'm doing. But it's also there for me to share with other people. So, you know, if, if it's a useful technique, if it's a useful build, people can learn from it. Or they can just look at it and go... Yeah, I don't want to do it that way and, and do it their own way. Uh, but either way, the multi-part ones tend to work slightly better in that way. So for something like this, for an armour piece, I definitely really only want to do a single part, single video, because it's really more just a build log of how I've approached uh, doing this little Tamiya kit. So that's what today is about. I've rambled on for long enough, so let's... Uh, dive on over to the bench and start building the Tamiya SAS Jeep. So as is usual I'll be back at the end for a summary and outgoing thoughts on how it all went. Over to me on the bench. So it's a box. It's a box with a Jeep in it. So not a huge part count but uh, plenty of furious staring because they're slightly unfamiliar parts to me. A certain amount of staring at the instruction sheet as well, which, uh, given the age of the kit, is actually quite vague, especially vague on any colour call-outs and stuff like that. So you've kind of got to make a lot of things up for yourself. 
But the basic construction sequence, essentially you start with the chassis, a uh, little bit of cleanup, the mold is showing its age, so, you know, the parts are not brilliantly molded. But considering, you know, this is the chassis and underside, not a huge amount is going to be visible anyway. So in terms of construction, I think getting the leaf springs and the drive shafts and stuff cleaned up and aligned properly is probably the trickiest bit. Uh, the location points are not brilliantly identified. Uh, not as good as later Tamiya kits, but then this is an extremely old Tamiya kit. But once they are suitably located and, and uh, cleaned up, Tamiya Extra Thin, of course, is the uh, bonding agent of choice in this case. So just run a little bit of that into any of the locating points and the capillary action will just draw it in. And all those parts will be securely glued together. So the overall assembly on this actually goes very, very quickly. And very soon, kind of up to a uh, basic of what kind is beginning to look like a Jeep now. There is plenty of cleanup still. A few glue joints need to be cleaned up. Uh, a little bit more careful gluing could probably avoid it, but some of my gluing technique was a little bit sloppy, so a little bit of cleanup to do. Uh, so the wheels themselves are all in two parts. They are slightly different between front and rear. So it is worth uh, keeping check on that. And then there's two spare wheels and tires to go uh, somewhere else on the vehicle as well. Uh, various people have put them in different places on the back in the kind of cargo bit in the back of the, the, the bed of the Jeep. So there's a reasonable amount of stowage that comes with this kit. There's a lot of jerry cans. They are showing their age, so they're not brilliantly molded. The join lines do need a little bit of work to clean up. But once that's done, it's all happy days. So on the Jeep itself, because this is intended to be a somewhat of a beaten up uh, World War II North African Jeep. Uh, I'm going to add a little bit of damage to the bumper and a little bit of damage to the body. So using a scalpel blade, kind of gouging out some deeper scratches. Uh, also using a little bit of heat source just to melt some of the plastic a little bit. And just to put some kind of depression marks on the bumper to show where it's it's crashed into rocks, other vehicles, whatever that may be. Just to add a little bit of kind of aging to that bumper. So once all that work is done and all those parts are cleaned up. Uh, everything gets mounted onto a variety of coffee stirrers, cocktail sticks and clips. And I can get on with the priming process. So everything is primed in UMP grey. Uh, so this is shot through the UMP apex at about 25 to 30 psi. Everything is going to get about two or three coats of primer. Although, in fairness... The grey primer goes down very, very well and gets good coverage with, with just one, one and a half to two coats quite easily. So on the chassis itself, it is important to get all the kind of awkward angles. There's lots of angles to get to. There's lots of hidden away places underneath. Uh, but good diligence around your spraying technique, making sure you get through all the angles, you will get to all of those awkward spots. And then I progress on to finishing off the main body in the UMP grey. So this is coat number one. Ultimately, I end up putting about two and a half, three coats uh, on the vehicle in total. So once that primer has had a chance to dry, uh, the Jeep is given a coat of Tamiya XF62 olive drab. So my original intention, I was going to use hairspray chipping. So I've given it a coat of olive drab because as I understand it, these vehicles would have been delivered uh, basically as a kit, all pre-painted in olive drab, and then they would get field painted. Now I've decided not to do the hairspray chipping. However, the olive drab coat is quite useful. 
because I'm going to apply quite a patchy coat of XF59 Desert Yellow. So I'm just going to mottle it a little bit, fade it in a few places, not get a complete layer of coverage of the, the Desert Yellow, because again, this will give more of an impression of a vehicle that's been field sprayed rather quickly and a little bit more worn where the paint has been, you know, eroded, abraded back to the base olive drab color. So for this stage to get that modeling effect, I'm using a finer detail airbrush. In this case, I'm using my H&S Infinity. Uh, I think I've got the 0.15 needle in it. And this gives me a lot more finer control over where the, where the paint goes. And this is not sped up footage. This is me in real time, just working my way around the vehicle just to get quite a incomplete coat of desert yellow across the vehicle. So this is built up over a number of coats until I end up with something that's a very patchy looking desert yellow color. So once I'm happy with that, and that's been set aside to dry for a good 12 hours, uh, I'm now going to chip the paintwork using the sponge method. So I've got a little piece of sponge. And I'm using the olive drab color as the first stage of chipping. So dip that sponge in a little bit of olive drab paint, remove any excess on a kitchen roll, piece of kitchen roll, and then just begin dabbing away at any of the locations where I want to basically reveal that under color of olive drab. So as you can imagine, the, the front kind of bull bar bumper will get quite a lot of uh, impact and damage. Any edges on the vehicle will get quite a lot of impact and damage. So I tend to work the edges quite heavily. Working my way consistently and slowly around the kit. Now, one thing I would suggest if using the sponge method, uh, keep on changing sponge. Keep on rotating it as well, because that way you don't get repeated patterns as much. So you get much more of a random kind of pattern. So gradually rotate it around as you're moving around the vehicle. And as you can see, I'm beginning to move across the bonnet to highlight some other random areas where chipping may occur on the vehicle so, so there is a little bit of thought put into where i've decided to chip i am focusing on anything that might be areas where the stowage is going to go edges of panels on the vehicle anywhere that's more likely to get you know hit scratched uh, around the entry points as well where kind of Boots will abrade and damage the paint anywhere where the stowage is going to go. So all of those areas will get a lot more of a focus uh, with some chipping. So as you can see, I'm moving on to a different piece of sponge, different sizes, different shapes, and it all just adds to the random nature. So once that stage is complete, I'm using a very fine detail brush just to join together any of the larger areas that are shown chipped just to show where there's, you know, complete removal of that base coat of paint. And a particular focus is on that from front bumper section. So once that olive drab is complete, uh, I'm now infilling some of the areas with XF84 dark iron. So again, that's just to show where basically any of the chipping has gone through the desert yellow, through the olive drab bass back to basically the base metal of the kit. Now, it is, of course, a good idea at this stage to avoid using any strong metallic colours uh, as they end up just being too bright and don't look realistic. Uh, now, there is a few select areas where some rust tones and a little bit of metallic are used, but ultimately that's that's quite restrained. Uh, now, there is a few elements of detailed painting as well that I've needed to do. So the seats, they would have been covered in a canvas Time material, so they're given a coat of some kind of khaki color from Ravel Aqua Range. 
And then, of course, all the jerry cans need to be chipped as well. So they are done in exactly the same method as are the wheel hubs as well. So once all that chipping is complete, I'm now going to add most of this stowage to the vehicle because ultimately the, the next stage of kind of weathering it, uh, you want that consistent kind of weathering effect across the entire vehicle, basically. You don't want to have a nicely weathered vehicle with lots of sand and dust on it and then put on a perfectly clean jerry can. So just using a little bit of CA glue, uh, the various pieces of stowage, so jerry cans for a front and back. Uh, I have made the rack mounting system as suggested in the instructions as well. And all those pieces are glued on to the body using some CA glue. So the wheels are also added at this stage. This also kind of helps uh, make sure that when I get to the weathering, the more detailed weathering stage next, that that weathering scheme is consistent across all the kind of major parts of the vehicle. So ultimately, I end up not using all of the stowage. I use most of it. So there's quite a few jerry cans, a couple of rolls, bags, various things. Now, the, the Tamiya stowage is showing its age, but it's not too bad. So there is two crew members included as well. Uh, here I am trying to paint them in some kind of effective flesh tones. They're not brilliantly molded. They have some seam, line, seam lines to clean up as well. And just the definition on a lot of the parts is quite vague and soft. Uh, so it is hard to get a very kind of convincing figure out of a poorly molded figure like this. However, I think I've done a reasonable job. And once they're dry, they're given a coat of UMP sand uh, from their water-based wash range, which is dried off using a hot air source and then any excess removed with a wet cotton bud or damp cotton bud. And again, that just gives the impression of a well-worn and well-weathered SAS team member. So crew figures are set aside, going to move on to doing a little bit more weathering on the vehicle itself. So some of the rolled up uh, tarps, camouflage nets, whatever they are. So they're given a coat or well, they're given a wash using MIG ammo neutral brown just helps kind of tone down the colors a little bit the wash itself can be dried with a hot air source and once fully dry any excess removed with a cotton bud and some odorless mineral spirits just as shown here well, partially shown, a little bit off screen. I do apologize. As you can see, I've put a little bit of tape on my desk just to mark where the camera should be. So next it's on to adding some light dust effects. So this is another wash from the MIG ammo range. This should give more of a representation of that buildup of sand around any recessed parts. And more importantly, areas like the wheels which is exactly what i'm doing now so as you can see a little bit of wash so even though it's a matte paint that wash will flow quite easily just using a very long liner brush with a fairly fine point and that light sand color light dust color can be flown into any recesses, any specific areas around the vehicle. Of course, with, with the matte finish, uh, when you go back to clean it up, the, the, the light dust will actually help stain the underlying paint as well. It doesn't get completely removed like it would with a, with a gloss finish. So that just helps the blending effect. Essentially, it makes the, the in some ways, makes the dust act more like a filter rather than completely like a wash. 
And then, of course, any excess can be cleaned off and removed with a cotton bud and some odorless mineral spirits. So this process is basically performed all the way around the vehicle. Uh, every area, both sides, front, top, rear. Not so much on the underside because it's not going to be particularly visible. So then, of course, after that stage, we also have some mud effects from ammo. Uh, and that is used to basically fill in any of the tracks in the, the tires. So this is uh, more of a 3D effect. Also enamel based, so it can be easily cleaned up with some mineral spirits as well. But basically just dabbing it on any areas of interest. I don't really want too thick a layer. So, so this particular material you can build up into much more of a 3D effect. But in this case, as the vehicle is operating in dry sand, not a huge amount is going to adhere to the vehicle. But some obviously will. But not in big thick clumps like you would with wet mud. So a little bit more restraint is shown. So there is a slightly darker tone as well. That's mixed in and selected areas as well. That just helps blend the colours and gets rid of an element of the kind of more monotone effect of the sand colour. Uh, so that darker colour is used kind of mainly in the wheel wells, the chassis rails, any area where it's a little bit darker on the vehicle. So once that's completely dry and cleaned up, uh, I've also got some MIG ammo sand pigment. Uh, so that's sp basically flicked onto various areas of the outside of the kit. Again, any areas of kind of interest, and then I'm just using a brush just to blend that into any areas where I want a little bit more sand. Again, the slightly different color blended with the other effects just kind of breaks up any risk of it being a monotone sand color. And particularly in and around the foot wells, that's where I've kind of collected a little bit more sand because that's where it'll get picked up from boots, etc. from uh, SAS team members. So overall, so far, pretty happy with, with what's been weathered. Uh, I'm going to add the figures in as well, get them posed in exactly the right position I want them. I do need to add the steering wheel as well. But ultimately, we're getting towards the back end of the build where everything is consistently coming together. There is a few small bits and pieces left. There's all the weaponry and the steering wheel to be added. So once that's added, I have some ammo make splashing effects as well. So there's a couple of areas I just add a few splashes of. Again, that's a light dust sandy color. There's also a little bit of uh, dusty earth oil brusher used as well. So with that all done, the kit can be set to one side and I can now move on to making basically a display base for it, which is conveniently made from a very small picture frame and some polyfiller. Now polyfill is just a trade kind of universal filler for filling holes and walls. In this case, I'm using it just to build up a little bit of terrain uh, basically using the back of the photo frame just to kind of sculpt it into place. Just up a, just to build up a little bit of an embankment of one side, uh, then kind of inserting some kind of tracks for where the vehicle is going to sit. So once that's had a good 24 hours to dry, I'm going to come back and prime it in UMP black. So that just gives a nice dark color. As you can see, a few bits of the polyfiller were quite dry and are flaking off. But that's not going to be a problem. We just want to get that black color down. And that'll give the basis of the subsequent paint layers. So once that's completely dried, uh, I'm going back using some Vallejo Model Air Dark Earth. 
as the next base tone. That just gives a nice deep brown colour to base everything on. At the moment it looks very much like a muddy scene, but trust me it'll begin to come together in the next steps. And then finally going back with, uh, I think it's dark tan, which again is a lighter colour than the dark earth and beginning to get more towards the kind of sandier yellow tones that you would see in a desert. So again, I'm just mottling it a little bit, just have a little bit of colour variation. Just so that when I go on to the next layers, there'll be a little bit of tonal variation in where things are placed. So as you can see, that's the basic layout. There's a couple of grooves left for the tyres, so that makes the vehicle sit a little bit better in the scene. And next up, I've got a variety of materials which are picked up off uh, basically a railway scenic supplier off eBay. So I'm using some diluted PVA. Actually, I think it's diluted uh, uh, glue and glaze. And using some of the sand material that I've got. So in addition to some sand, I'm also coating a few individual stones and some PVA, popping them in a few selected places, and just progressing across the little scene in various stages. Just adding some sand, adding some different materials. Just basically to give that kind of final, this is where the vehicle would operate type look. A couple of larger stones have been added, a little bit of vegetation in places. Once I'm happy with all that and that's sufficiently dried, I'm then going back in with some desert yellow to basically unify the colours between uh, the colours used in the vehicle as well. Also using some ammo sand tones as well. So once I'm happy with all those colours, I can remove the masking tape that's been applied. And that leaves a nice clear black frame. On which I can place the vehicle. And pose it just like so. So that is uh, basically it for this build. Let's have a quick look at some of the final photos. So very pleased with how it's come out. Definitely a few areas that I think could have been better, but ultimately for, you know, for a first foray into 35th scale, I am pleased with the outcome. So let's head back to me for the final thoughts on this build. So, there we go, my first foray into 35th scale armour. Uh, in this case, not really armour, but, you know, AFEs, that 35th scale world. So, if you like the video, don't forget to give it a like, give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you're not a subscriber as well, please subscribe. Uh, hopefully, you'll find some interesting topic uh, within my channel to watch, because I do, you know, I do build aircraft and I do build cars and bikes and now I build armor as well seemingly uh, so yeah so please like and subscribe it would be appreciated and of course you know for all the people that are existing subscribers thank you very much uh, for your continued support so what did I think of that uh, I I really enjoyed it I, I, I won't I won't lie I enjoyed it I am looking forward to doing couple of other armor kits that i've got i've got a 35th scale hannah mag from tamia and i've got a 35th scale uh sam 6 from trumpeter just quite modern armor uh so yeah so i i yeah i do definitely plan on building those when i don't know because i plan on building everything and i've got a lot of stuff so but I do plan on building them and I do look forward to building them as well. Which, uh, doing a subject like this for the first time, I do kind of think, yeah, okay. Is this going to be a good, you know, when you get into it, is this going to, you know, is this going to be something new that I want to do? 
And I would say, yes, I have actually enjoyed doing it. Uh, am I pleased with the, with the finish of the build? Generally, yes. I think it looks better in real life than it does in photographs. I would say that. Yeah, trust me on that one. I think my general kind of thoughts about it overall is that, you know, there's, there's a few things I should have done earlier. Stuff like the, the weapons and the stowage. They're not brilliantly moulded by Tamiya because it's quite an old kit anyway. But I think I could have modelled them a little bit better. Uh, I think on the overall weathering I probably overdid it. Particularly with the chipping. I think that just kind of ends up in having a, you know, quite a, quite a muddy finish. If you know what I mean. Not in the true sense of having mud all over it but just kind of. You know, the, the colours kind of clash together too much and they get mixed together. So it just kind of looks a bit, for me, it just, it's lacking a certain amount of finesse and definition of, you know, transitions between colours, transition between effects, which, you know. But then maybe that's a consequence of actually, ultimately, the kit is incredibly small. So it can be hard to convey, you know, that battered desert jeep versus, you know, actually having that kind of clear definition to show that kind of aging effect which you know on a larger kind of arm, armored vehicle you can kind of progress how with kind of decays in various bits so so that for me is a little bit a little bit of a lesson coming out of it to think more about what i'm going to weather and wear which maybe that's the you know one of the key parts of armor anyway so so yeah but other than that I'm I'm really pleased with it. You know, I, I'm uh, delighted with how the base came out. Very simple base. I mean, that was literally done in one evening just to kind of sculpt a bit of polyfiller on, you know, a photo frame. And then once that was dry, just a couple of hours, a bit of acrylic paint, you know, build up some colours, add some cheap simple uh diorama accessories i got off ebay you know some sand and some stones a couple more you know a little bit of pva some more coats of paint odd bit of green vegetation very simple base just to kind of pose the vehicle so it's not trying to tell a story it's not you know it's not a big diorama but it's just you know a nice little base so really pleased with how that came out and how it looks uh, i think the vehicle looks well on it so there we go. Overall result, very happy. So that's it. That that's it for the video build. Uh, I'm gonna finish on that note. Uh, I've spoken for far too long. Probably dragged this video out to well beyond the thirty minute mark. So I apologise for that. I'm sure people that were watching have probably switched off by now because they don't want to listen to me waffling. So once again, thank you all for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll see you all in another video very, very soon. So uh, bye bye for now. Bye bye.